I would like to thank the organizer for organizing this very interesting meeting, in particular Ken Shen for not wanting me here today, but anyways. Uh, so uh, yes, I will, uh, this, this talk is about uh, supernova survivors, so we are uh, continuing what we were discussing yesterday and um, essentially I, I don't have to, to talk about supernova a lot because all the background was covered yesterday and uh, some of the results that I will present here uh, were done in collaboration with all the people listed here. And so essentially during this talk I will, um, I, I, I thought that it's useful to give a, um, an overview of the stars, the few stars that we know to be very likely supernova survivors uh, and then uh, describe the possible evolutionary uh, scenarios for these um, particular objects and see what are the future prospects of this uh, kind of, um, uh, in, the, in this field of investigation. So, uh, we have seen that um, identifying uh, supernova survivors and progenitors of supernova, thermonuclear supernova explosions is a very difficult task. So, uh, in general, this, this, um, the, this kind of um, searches are done for uh, supernovae uh, exploding in uh, uh, other galaxies. And there have been suggestions that, uh, for instance, in this particular one, uh, we might be able to see uh, a star uh, that is um, remaining after the explosion. Whether this is the donor star in the thermonuclear supernova, or uh, the, the white dwarf that may be surviving to the supernova explosion is still a bit unclear because as you can see, the galaxy is far away. And so we have a very, um, at the moment, very little information, but you can see that these objects are surviving even after a few years and uh, still remain very bright. Uh, this task has been um, um, performed for years uh, in our galaxy, uh, but still, even for the nearest and most recent supernovae, uh, it's still unclear whether uh, a donor star uh, is present and has uh, survived to the explosion. So here we have the examples of this, uh, the Tycho and Kepler supernovae, and there is a very interesting review by um, Pilar Ruiz La Puente describing how this um, uh, the search for supernova survivors and donors uh, has been going on in the past years. But then, uh, even if this task uh, was complicated for uh, this nearby supernovae, uh, already in the past, uh, there were some identification of very fast stars. And so, so far, uh, also thanks to Gaia, there are at least uh, eight very outstanding stars which have very large velocities. And so the first one was this uh, US 708 that was also identified before Gaia. Uh, at the time was clearly the fastest star in our galaxy, unbound from the Milky Way, uh, which essentially has a velocity that is dominated, uh, um, uh, the, the velocity vector is dominated by the radial velocity. Then there is this other white dwarf that was also identified before Gaia uh, in the Sloan uh, survey, uh, and which is very particular uh, because it's an atmosphere that is dominated by oxygen. Then we have these other new stars that also were identified uh, before the Gaia DR2, uh, in particular the prototype uh, LP40365, uh, and then uh, we did a follow-up of uh, similar stars when Gaia DR2 was published. And then, of course, there are the D6 stars that we already know about. Uh, they were entirely identified uh, thanks to the Gaia uh, proper motions parallaxes. And so the properties of these stars are, um, in general, very similar. Apologies for, for using a table in a talk. But this is a small table, so I think everyone can easily read it. So in particular, they have relatively large velocities in, uh, from the proper motion point of view, except US 708, US 708 which is the most distant one. So uh, as I said before, the motion is dominated by the radial velocity. Uh, 
And all of them are typically nearby, again, except the US 708. And so they have very large velocities. Uh, but the most important thing is that most of them are unbound from the Milky Way, um, except two stars, this white dwarf here, and another star in this group of uh, LP40365 objects. And so, thanks to their properties, um, it's uh, this outstanding properties has been relatively, let's say, easy to identify them. Uh, because first of all, they all nearby the sun. So we are within uh, around two kiloparsecs. And as we will see later, they are typically inflated objects. So even except for the white dwarf, this uh, oxygen white dwarf, uh, it, it, we, we can explore a larger volume. And of course, they are these large proper motions. So I have here an animation showing how they evolve uh, in the um, how they move in in this uh, in the 3D space, and you will see that this uh, this red objects and and, uh, and yellow and the uh, US 708 will leave the galaxy in around uh, 100 million years or so. Uh, so they quickly leave the Milky Way. But here you can see these other objects that are bound to the Milky Way, and the interesting thing is they. Uh, if uh, we consider the galactic rotation is going clockwise, they move anti-clockwise respect to the galactic rotation. So, of course, all uh, a kinematic study depends on the um, uh, on the kind of galactic potential that we are using. In particular, uh, the white dwarf here is getting very close to the galactic bulge. So, depending on how we model the bulge, uh, the orbit might change. But also the, um, the trajectories of the stars that left the Milky Way very rapidly uh, might depend on, uh, on the um, mass distribution and also uh, total mass of the galactic halo. Because we are seeing that they reach this, uh, uh, a distance of 100 kiloparsecs, so well beyond the galactic halo in very rapid times. But of course, this may, uh, their orbits may, de the, may be deflected in some ways. And also, we know that there is an effect of the Magellanic clouds that is not accounted in this simulation. So, looking at the properties of these stars in the Gaia HR diagram, in particular the DR2 um, uh, HR diagram, where uh, all the stars were identified and characterized, you can see that all of them, uh, these new objects sit in between the main sequence and the white dwarf cooling sequence. So they are uh, relatively large, larger than a typical white dwarf. Also, US 708, of course, is uh, sitting here at the hot end of the um, uh, um, uh, sub-dwarf uh, sub O-type uh, stars. And we have this other, the white dwarf here. Uh, being slightly brighter than the, than the typical white dwarf, because uh, as we will see, it's a low mass, uh, relatively low mass white dwarf. And so, thanks to Gaia, of course, we could uh, estimate the radii. So this is a confirmation that these objects are typically large. And uh, as you can see here, I have a comparison of uh, LP40365 respect to Jup Jupiter. So it's about two times the, uh, the radius of Jupiter. Uh, they are fainter than the sun, uh, but all of them are expanded objects. So the idea is that if they are produced during a supernova explosion, they get heated and they expand. Um, and so if we manage also to get other physical parameters like the temperature and the uh, surface gravity, we can also have an estimate uh, using this, uh, this information of their masses. So uh, let's look at this, uh, the, the properties of each individual class of, super, of uh, runaway stars. Uh, so the first one is the uh, US 708, which is a uh, hot subdwarf, which is rich in helium and also rich in nitrogen. And it's also a fast rotator. So this fast rotation is an indication of uh, very likely uh, binary interaction. It's much faster than a typical hot subdwarf. And, um, and so uh, this fast rotation and this large velocity was one indication of a very violent ejection 
uh, possibly for this uh, type 1A super, uh, thermonuclear supernova scenario. The next one is the oxygen white dwarf. In particular here, you can see the spectra uh, observed by um, HST. You can see there are all these other elements, also carbon, oxygen, magnesium, aluminum, uh, silicon, and uh, there are no helium and hydrogen in the spectra. And, uh, and the white dwarf, as I said, has a relatively low mass. Then here we have a spectrum of the prototype of the LP4365 stars. And you can see the spectrum is totally dominated by these metal lines. We, are, we have an optical spectrum here and uh, uh, Hubble uh, UV, near UV observations. There is some little carbon also detected in the atmosphere thanks to this very faint line. The strongest line are this magnesium one uh, lines, but the atmosphere is essentially dominated by neon, then oxygen, and magnesium is the third most dominant element. But we detect many other elements, and in particular, thanks to, um, to the observations done by TESS, uh, JJ and uh, collaborators managed to determine a rotation period for this star, uh, which is a, of about nine hours. And finally, here there is a spectrum of the uh, D6 star uh, number two, which is also known as LP398-9, uh, which is cooler respect to the to this other uh, LP4365 stars. We can also see that from the HR diagram as a redder color, uh, as a carbon oxygen dominated atmosphere, and uh, recently was also um, shown to have uh, infrared excess and a likely this presence of a circumstellar material that maybe is dominated by, uh, by carbon, as we can see from this fit from, uh, uh, from, uh, from a spectrum. Also here, uh, hydrogen and helium are undetected. And in particular, this object is also interesting because it can be traced back to um, uh, the position of a supernova remnant. So we can, uh, in theory, estimate it's the only object for, for which we can estimate surely uh, an age, at least from this kinematic analysis. So all these properties are suggesting that the stars are forming uh, through this uh, thermonuclear supernovae. And so, um, but how this happen? How do they get these uh, very large velocities? Essentially through this mechanism that was already uh, studied long time ago, uh, introduced by Blau and uh, also uh, formalized by Eels and uh, discussed by Taurus for uh, this very massive uh, and young uh, runaway stars. So essentially when you have a binary, and for instance in this animation uh, done by uh, Andreas Irgang, uh, you have a core collapse supernova where you form a neutron star uh, and you lose enough mass, you manage to unbind this binary. And so you can see the uh, neutral star flying off and the other, uh, the, the, the blue star also flying uh, more or less in the opposite direction. But of course, when we are looking at thermonuclear supernova, we have an advantage that is that we uh, should entirely destroy the white dwarf. And so the donor star for sure will be a runaway star and the velocity of this ejection will depend on the uh, initial orbital uh, velocity. So in this figure from Ken's paper, you can see how uh, this velocity depends on the mass of the uh, donor star here on the x-axis, and this is the uh, orbital velocity when the star is transferring mass to the uh, white dwarf that will explode through uh, Roche lobe overflow. And then these bars depend, uh, the width depend on, uh, I think, a donor mass, uh, uh, accretor mass between 0 0.8 and one solar mass. And so you can see that uh, if the donor is a carbon oxygen white dwarf, you, you would get the highest velocities. Then it's lower for a helium uh, white dwarf donor because they are larger, so they don't transfer mass from a, a larger uh, orbital distance. And of course, much slower velocities from uh, non-degenerate uh, companions. So for these uh, eight supernova survivors, I have this uh, new interpretation of the figure that we have seen yesterday many times. 
so essentially we have the um, the progenitor scenarios and here uh, the uh, explosion okay the explosion scenario so for this LP4665 uh, the suggested explosion type is near Chandrasekhar mass and you have a single degenerate donor. Uh, these white dwarfs in particular, these objects in particular, they are suggested to be the supernova survivor. So the, the, the white dwarf survivor. So they were former white dwarfs accreting mass from a companion uh, that only partly burned. Well, in this case, we have a single degenerate scenario where US 708 was the donor and likely this other, the oxygen white dwarf was the accretor, accretor in a supernova that explodes the sub Chandrasekha. And here for the D6 stars, we have the double degenerate scenario with the uh, sub Chandrasekha uh, mass explosion. So essentially how this, uh, this explosions, this supernova happen, uh, for US, US 708 was suggested to be a double detonation, uh, uh, within this uh, helium star uh, donor channel, while here you, uh, for the D6 stars we have two white dwarfs essentially. And uh, of course you know what D6 means. I I never remember the order, so I put here a cloud with all the Ds. And um, while for the other for the other stars we have that the this oxygen white dwarf uh, J1240. Uh, also exploded with a double detonation and likely there was partial burning. We only see oxygen, we don't see the heavy elements. So uh, maybe it happened through this uh, scenario where when it was accreting a thick helium shell. Well here for the LP4365 stars we have a deflagration uh, likely from accreting where the white dwarf was accreting from, uh, from uh, a non-degenerate companion maybe also a helium star, and, uh, and the suggested scenario is uh, uh, that the, uh, the scenario that reproduced observations for uh, supernovae 1AX, but maybe there could be also something related to this uh, thermonuclear electron capture supernovae, where you have an oxygen neon white dwarf exploding. So when we look at the abundances of the stars, in particular for this group of objects, we see that they are very rich in uh, alpha elements, so oxygen, neon, and magnesium, uh, but also rich in uh, uh, iron peak elements. And so when we compare two models coming from the Fink et al. hydrodynamic simulations or the Jones et al. Uh, simulations where they make explode carbon oxygen or oxygen, neon, supernovae, we see that there is some agreement because of course you are going to uh, make explode a white dwarf and you produce these iron peak elements. Also very large differences, especially for these alpha elements. And so uh, one important thing is that we, we have to take into account is that we are looking at these uh, atmospheres uh, while they simulate the bulk composition of the explosions. And I will show something more uh, in the next few slides. One important thing also is that we detect this magnesium to be super solar. So there is a, a direct connection to a, a single degenerate scenario. To produce, uh, did I say man magnesium? This is manganese. Anyway. And again, here is a comparison between the LP4365 stars with the oxygen white dwarf. And you see that they have very similar abundance pattern for the alpha elements, but the other star doesn't have a elements to be detected. So this may be related to this uh, part partial burning of uh, uh, the, uh, the core of the star that didn't produce all the other heavy elements. And so here in this last slide, you can see a comparison of the composition by mass of the atmosphere of these stars compared to the models. You can see that they are very rich in neon and oxygen, while the bulk compositions of the simulations is actually having uh, more elements like carbon, or in this case, heavy elements for the oxygen neon explosion. So finally, this is my last uh, two slides very quickly. There are some other open questions, in particular, what are the evolutionary timescales? They must evolve relatively uh, slowly 
uh, as suggested by simulation uh, by um, uh, the work by done by uh, Evan and collaborators. And so maybe we are never going to see at least those that are unbound to become white dwarfs because they will become very faint, so uh, invisible uh, from Earth. There is a problem on how these heavy elements um, settle in the atmosphere and also still open questions about the progenitors and ejection velocities. And in particular, the velocity distribution may be a problem because depending on the ejection velocities, uh, many of these objects might have relatively small proper motion. So it's still difficult to identify through a large number of slowly moving stars in our Milky Way. And finally, uh, I just wanted to list here a few other objects that are related to them, still don't have very good uh, Gaia parallaxes, so it's a bit difficult to, to perform a kinematic analysis, but there is another Otsa dwarf that is similar to uh, US-708, but this is bound to the Milky Way. It's a halo object uh, or not, it's a bit unclear. There is another uh, twin of the uh, LP4365 that uh, we are taking spectra for now, and two hotter stars that may be related to, to this class uh, were observed again in our paper by another one by Fantine et al. Uh, in their paper. Also, there are contaminants, so it's very important that, uh, to measure, for instance, radial velocities. In particular, for this DQ, White Dwarf was suggested to have a very large radial velocity that made it uh, as a runaway star, but then uh, Kalka and collaborators determined a proper, a, a, a more accurate radial velocity, uh, confirming that it's just a normal White Dwarf. And here we have a, a, a magnetic White Dwarf, where we know it's difficult to measure radial velocities for these objects. The, and so, it's difficult to claim that this could be a, a runaway star that formed in a supernova scenario. But again, this is a very interesting object because it may be get very close to the sun, uh, almost entering the Earth cloud. And so it could be a problem for future of life on Earth. So see, this is the last figure showing these uh, candidates here, uh, these purple objects. And uh, here I have my summary where essentially we have eight well-characterized objects that uh, are likely supernova survivors. As we have seen, there is a variety of thermonuclear that can produce these uh, uh, very high velocity stars, and so they can form through single and double degenerate scenarios and different type of explosion mechanisms. We need to improve our analysis, in particular also including the new stars, and also improve the modeling uh, of the future and past evolution. And of course, we hope to identify, uh, maybe serendipitously, many of uh, these new objects just uh, taking spectra at random of stars that may mimic their properties. So thank you, everyone, for listening. I'm ready for questions. Questions? Thanks for the talk. Can you say a little more about the uh, the proposed story for J1240? Uh, sorry, say again? For 1240, I think. That's oh, right. yes. So um, essentially, um, the interpretation that uh, we discussed in a paper was that the star as, um, actually, I can show you this slide here. Uh, these are the only elements that are detected. <laughs> No, and uh, there are no heavy elements. Um, and the star also has this large velocity, and so of course was produced by this supernova explosion, but what happened to the elements? I mean, is this an indication of what process uh, produced the star? Uh, one, one thing that could happen is that the heavy elements sunk down the atmosphere of the star, and we don't see them, so maybe it had a composition that is very similar to the LP40 stars. Of course, if we have a, 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 a thermonuclear supernova, we are kind of producing the same elements, and these depend on the on the uh, properties of the explosion, so the density, understand the temperature. But uh, you might have this um, this kind of explosions that were discussed by uh, Pauline et al. Uh, 
uh, where you have, um, if you accrete, if you accrete a thick helium uh, layer onto, uh, uh, I think it's 0 0.8 solar mass, uh, white dwarf, you might have, uh, you could also have a, a small production of uh, nickel, for instance. And so the elements were produced with a lower abundance and so maybe undetected or also sunk down. Okay. Maybe Boris can, can say more about that. If just a quick comment. Um, downward diffusion is not very likely because the mm. star has a very deep convection zone um, and the diffusion time scales are very long. So the abundances wouldn't change by large factors, the relative abundances. Yeah. And so I think the fact that uh, the upper limits on iron and nickel are quite tight and they're kind of two, two decks or so below the other stars, I think that is, that is real. Was the convective zone there the whole time? Um, good question. I don't know. Thanks. Thanks. Huh. Karin, another question? Go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the number of these objects compared to what you might expect if from various types of thermonuclear explosions? You know, like too many, too few, or? So we, 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 we did simulations and also Ken, I think, did the simulation in, in his paper. So um, I, I think we, we were kind of, it, it's, difficult, it's, it's a bit difficult to estimate the number because we see stars only within this range of magnitude. So we, uh, we don't know, uh, I'll show you the HR diagram if I find it again. So we considered that this is the typical magnitude uh, when we see, uh, where we see the star. So essentially you might, uh, considering that and considering an ejection velocity that was around, estimated to be around 600 kilometers per second, you might estimate a number of about 20 objects within two kiloparsecs. But then depending on, uh, on which direction they are moving, um, uh, some, some of them could be bound or unbound to the Milky Way and also have uh, a relatively small proper motions of around maybe 40, kilo, uh, 40 milliard seconds per year. In particular, this hottest star, um, as I think the smallest, um, no, maybe not, it doesn't have a relatively small proper motion, but in general, we, we, uh, we would expect at least 20. And the problem is that if they have these low problem motions, they are more difficult to identify. Uh, and photometrically, they may appear like any other star, even if they don't have, um, if they like an F type star, if they don't have problem motion. So essentially, I think a survey of objects that are similar colors uh, may be more successful. And uh, yeah. Nicola? Uh, following, hello? following up on what you just said, are there, have you tested if in other color spaces and color magnitude spaces, they stand out from other objects that on this diagram will look on the same, the same area? I mean, um, so having, having a spectrum like this, it starts to have a very large Palmer jump. So in Sloan or using Galax, it appears like a normal white dwarf uh, photometrically. And um, it does, doesn't have an infrared excess, so it doesn't stand out. Um, that's why the star was, uh, as a uh, GD name, so it was also this LFP name, was known as a, for seven, uh, for, for, since the 70s as a white dwarf candidate. And my, my idea is that maybe it was observed, but because the, pro, the positions weren't very good at the time, someone thought, oh, we observed an F-type star by mistake. Uh, and so it wasn't published for 50 years. Thanks. We have time for one quick one, if there's any. Seven. 
So just following up on this discussion of how many there are, is there, is there a fairly strong prediction that with spectroscopic surveys we should find order 15, 20 more of these? We're not going to find any more with Gaia, right? Like the Gaia data, we just, we have what we have. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know. There is, uh, there is hope, uh, for instance, like in uh, foremost, they may observe uh, random stars just to fill in the fibers. And so they could be observed uh, randomly. And one of the candidates, um, so the, the fourth star of this class was observed in Sloan. And if you go to the database, it's classified as F type. Um, but as uh, didn't have a parallax at the time uh, when we published the paper, now as a parallax with large errors. So we can estimate, I mean, it's very similar to this one. So maybe it has the same luminosity, uh, but you cannot place it in the HR diagram. So you need to observe them uh, randomly and just by looking at the spectrum, and maybe the radial velocity that is also large, you can confirm it as a candidate. So, so it's still hard to make a specific prediction of how many yeah. we'll find because we're relying on serendipity still. I mean, so all these surveys will, uh, will target F, G, and K stars. So if they also use stars that have poor parallaxes, maybe we'll get some more. <laughs> I hope. Let's thank Roberto again.